Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's second in our six part series, Educating the New Congress, step-by-step -step advocacy training for homeless educators and service providers. Today, we're gonna to focus in on how to effectively communicate with Congress. A little bit of background, again, just quick refresher for those of you who are new to Schoolhouse Connection. We are a national uh, advocacy organization working to overcome homelessness through education. Um, lots of resources on our website, a newsletter, and other tools that you can check out later. We are very excited for our special guest presenters today. We have uh, Thomas Lucas, TJ Lucas, from U.S. Senator Joe Manchin's office, and we'll be joined by Anna um, Dietrich, from, uh, who is with Senator Murkowski's office. She'll be joining us shortly. So I'm going to quickly turn it over to you, TJ, and just let you introduce yourself to our audience. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, my name is TJ Lucas, and I handle uh, education and housing policy for Senator Manchin. I've been with him now for about six years, and I am a lifelong resident of West Virginia uh, that stumbled my way to Capitol Hill here, and I'm happy to be here with you all today. Great. And again, we're, we're very excited because this is a whole session on communicating with congressional offices, so there's no better way to, to, to do that, to learn about that, than from uh, congressional staff who are often the ones that you will be interacting with um, in your advocacy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just give a quick overview of the of the series and then turn it over to Alian, um, who, who can introduce herself and go through some of the beginning. Last week we looked at getting grounded in the new Congress. Uh, we looked at sort of the dynamics of the 117th Congress, some of the top issues, the difference between lobbying and advocacy. So if you missed that or you want to share that with your colleagues, it's recorded, it's on our website. And of course, I already mentioned what today's uh, session is on. Next week, we'll look at uh, some success, some local examples of successful advocacy. So you'll hear from other liaisons and other service providers who've been engaged in their experiences. We'll look at social media and traditional media and how media can be an important tool that's really open and accessible to anybody to advance advocacy on behalf of children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. We'll have a special session on how to engage youth and parents with lived experience in advocacy. And then we're gonna close out the session with how to bring everything close to home and look at applying all of this to state and local advocacy. So in a nutshell, that's our series. I'm gonna turn it over now to, oh, I already did this part. I'm gonna turn it over now to Alian to talk about today's session. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, so for today's session, we are going to be covering um, generally the nuts and bolts of um, how to communicate with Congress. So we're first going to be covering some of the best strategies for communicating. Um, we're also going to go over um, how what you actually do when you are trying to set up a meeting or conduct a meeting. So we're going to go over effective meeting practices in terms of preparation, um, what to do during um, the meetings, and also what comes after, which is the following up and some tips and tricks for do's and don'ts. Um, then lastly, but not least, we're going to cover um, online and other forms of advocacy and just ways that you can get engaged. So um, we're going to just jump right into um, speaking about citizen-centric advocacy um, during the context of the pandemic. So um, basically this graph that we have here is um, it's based on research conducted by the Congressional Management Foundation, which is a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization that um, focuses on fostering better relationships between Congress and the people. So um, one of the main things that we can get from this is that um, during the context of the pandemic and um, so many things have so many building closures and persons switching to um, virtual means of communicating, we've also seen that extend to advocacy. So we see where so we see where um, congressional offices have been using, um, they, not only have they been much more open to engaging in advocacy with constituents through virtual means, but also constituents um, have been more likely to reach out to their members of Congress. And I just wanted to ask TJ if he can speak to, um, like, have you seen, what have you seen in your office in terms of changes and adjusting to virtual advocacy and um, virtual means of communication? 
Yeah, absolutely. And so the first thing that I'll say is, you know, obviously we are all still trying to fully understand how to communicate in the uh, the, the world that is, you know, COVID-19. And so I think the, the unique thing about being able to connect virtually is that we are able to engage with a lot of stakeholders that didn't necessarily have the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face, um, and or um, know how to initially connect with certain congressional staffs to raise um, certain issues that are important to them. And so from my office particularly, the senator will actually sit down with different groups based on uh, a particular issue. So whether it be homelessness uh, or seniors or education or whatever the case may be, um, you know, we really go out of our way to expand that and open that up. Um, and additionally, in a in addition to virtual meetings that we're able to have with a video screen, we've been able to do a lot of teletown halls that have enabled us to reach hundreds of, if not thousands on a particular topic. And that allows the Senator to directly talk with constituents that all they really need to have is, you know, access to a telephone. And so that's been the beautiful thing about this. Of course, we miss, uh, you know, engaging with everyone on fly-in days and different meetings throughout the year, but uh, we are, you know, just trying to take this in stride. And I would say from all of my colleagues uh, that I've engaged with on the Senate side, the vast majority of them are excited and um, would be happy to have a virtual meeting with any constituent uh, in their district or state. Thank you so much, TJ. And, um... I just want to be the first to welcome Anna Dietrich from the office of Senator Lisa Murkowski. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Um, if you want to take a second to introduce yourself, please feel free. Sure. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. I apologize uh, for the technical difficulties. I guess that's something we'll talk about today <laughs> in terms of virtual meetings. Um, but it's so wonderful to be here. My name is Anna Dietrich. I'm a legislative assistant for Senator Murkowski. I cover public health and housing for Senator Murkowski, um, along with trauma and behavioral health care. So I work um, on issues of homelessness as it relates to children, youth, and families. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then, so this next slide is just um, basically reiterating what we've been saying, but it, it's basically um, zoning in on the different methods that we've been seeing the, um, the different congressional offices use. And um, TJ was just getting into that. But Anna, if you want to chime in to just kind of speak to um, how you've noticed the change in your office in terms of virtual advocacy or virtual communication with constituents, um, et cetera, um, what has it been like in your office? Sure, um, and thank you so much, TJ, for, for kind of starting us off. Um, definitely a big change. I think kind of just as I experienced getting on, um, meetings are not quite as personable as they used to be. We definitely miss that kind of face-to-face uh, -face interaction, but the, the benefit of virtual meetings is that we get to meet, I think, with so many more constituents from across kind of the United States um, and within our state of Alaska, especially as Alaska, it's, it's hard to travel all the way to Washington, D.C. So that's been a big benefit. Um, I think one of the things to watch out for is um, you won't find as many congressional staff speaking on kind of video uh, kind of Zoom meetings as much as you'll see them kind of on conference calls or maybe even just calling their cell phones directly. The Senate is a little bit further behind when it comes to technology. So um, a lot of our technology just isn't, isn't quite where I think some people would expect it to be in terms of every call being a video conference call versus a conference line. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Um, so next, we're just going to cover some of the common methods of communicating with Congress that um, constituents can employ. So the first one is meetings, and meetings can be held. Um, they can either be group meetings, so maybe it's a group of liaisons from your state meeting with your senator, or they can be individual meetings as well. There are also town hall meetings, which are basically um, large forums for constituents to voice their concerns about um, key issues or um, specific issues to their um, district with their member of Congress and just um, have like a conversation with them. Um, then there are also letters. Um, we can You can have individual letters. So that could be just you sending an email or sending physical mail to um, your member of Congress or your senator. But then there are also group sign-on letters, um, which is another option. And this is where coalition building kind of comes into play sometimes um, because group sign-on letters, they're effective in the sense that they show wide spread support for an issue and they're typically um, filled with like-minded, um, they're comprised of the words of like-minded groups. Um, then there are also 
good old fashioned phone calls that can be employed, um, just calling into your office and asking to support um, a specific legislation. Um, then there's, of course, um, social media, which we've seen um, emerge for in, in terms of advocacy in recent years, but it is extremely effective, um, which we have seen. So now we're going to go through the nuts and bolts of meeting with congressional offices and kind of go through um, the different steps. We're going to walk you through what you have to do um, before the meeting in terms of setting up and how to prepare yourself for the meeting, what to do during the meeting, some tips and tricks, and then um, after in terms of the follow-up, which is um, super important as well. So we're gonna get right into it. But before that, we are going to discuss the um, understanding the titles of different congressional staff, and we're going to discuss them first, like in the level of seniority or responsibility. So um, first, we have the legislative correspondent. Then we'll see legislative aides. Then we have legislative assistants like TJ and Anna, who cover um, a wide range of specific issue areas. Then we also have counsel or general counsel, um, legislative directors, um, and also and then the most senior would position would be the chief of staff. So then getting into um, setting up the meeting. Can I, can I say just one thing real quick on that slide? Absolutely. Please. Yeah, so I actually um, have been an intern, a staff assistant, an LC, a ledge aide, and now I'm a LA. And so the, the unique thing about uh, each of these different roles is we have a different critical function to play in the legislative process. And essentially what you have with your chief of staff, he's managing every facet of the senator's portfolio from the legislation to the casework to the communication side and everything in between. Your legislative director is really the point person that controls all of his legislative actions, as well as sometimes a council. Uh, but your council really is acts more as, you know, uh, campaign finance and that sort of thing as well sometimes. Obviously um, not with, um, not in the official role, but they oftentimes have that background. The thing that I uh, will, will highlight is the two most common legislative um, team members that you will see on a particular issue is a legislative assistant and an LC. Usually they're kind of paired together and they handle a similar portfolio, if not the exact same. The way that my office does it is we break up each um, legislative portfolio by uh, committee. So you have different committees of jurisdiction that work on that. And the only thing that I will say is don't be discouraged. Uh, no matter who you are given to interact with, treat every single person as if they were the senator themselves. Um, because oftentimes your LCs are taking on the bandwidth that your legislative assistant doesn't have and or your LD. And, nine times out of ten your lc is going to advocate for your issue more if you're able to make a good case for your district or to your state uh, because they have the capacity to do so and oftentimes as an la i'm overwhelmed in a lot of different areas and my lc just won't hush about a particular topic because they know it's going to have a great benefit for for west virginia and i so appreciate the opportunity to lean in on their experience so i will i just wanted to highlight that regardless of who you have the opportunity to connect with make sure that you're giving it your your best sales pitch because at the end of the day it doesn't matter who you talk to it matters what you talk about absolutely amen can i get a snap <laughs> <laughs> excellent um i have forward the slide here thank you barbara okay so next going to setting up the meetings and how do we do that so um one of the most important things is, um, and of course, as TJ mentioned, it's it's super great to meet with um, any member of staff because they can all help you and they can all um, advance um, the reason, uh, advance your concerns to the member. But typically, you would reach out to the staff who handles the issues that you plan to discuss um, initially. So one way you can do this is um, you can find the phone numbers of your um, representative's office or your senator's office for the House. You can go on house.gov for the Senate. You can refer to senate.gov and you can just um, easily call and ask, um, can I get the name of your education staffer? Because, and this is this would be for if you are trying to speak with someone on issues relating to early childhood, K through 12 or higher education, like say you are um, a McKinney Vento liaison and you want to speak specifically about students experiencing homelessness, um, you would typically refer to the education staffer. If you want to discuss issues related to HUD homeless assistance, for example, um, you would then reach out to the housing staffer. So once again, you could just call their office and say, hey, um, my name is so-and-so, could I please get the email for your 
your housing staffer and then um, that's it you can send them an email which we'll get into next but schoolhouse connection has actually we really love to find new ways to um, bring you all into advocacy and make it a bit easier for you so we have actually compiled um, two lists one containing the contact information for education staffers for the 117th congress for both house and senate and a similar one for housing staffers so we have the um, links here um, i can send them in the chat afterwards as well and also feel free to contact either barbara or myself at any point in time for access to this and um so you can cut out the the phone middleman and have the information right there so um when you are reaching out you'll include the purpose of your meeting and if you are going to be having someone else join you on the meeting mention that as well and um, probably just some background um and also the times that you're available and I'll just add um, one thing here too, which is, you know, we we have the contact information as it is now for the 117th Congress, but there's a lot of turnover. So, um, you know, you may find that you'll email the person on the list for your district or your state, and you know, it'll get a bounce back. Um, then you would call, or that a new staff may um, may be the person who turns it over and says, "I don't handle that anymore. I'm covering something else." Um, and I don't know, um, TJ and Anna, if there's anything you want to say here specifically about kind of the importance of that first reach out in terms of who 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 is the person that the constituent would would send a message to. I think it's always helpful to include more staff than less. So I, I think, you know, um, always ask, and if it's two staffers, three staffers that kind of cover the broad range of topics that you want to discuss, include all of them. Um, and don't be wary if, if it's, you know, you're including three, even five staffers, because I think um, staff appreciate when you loop um, everyone in rather than just kind of focusing in on one. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask for the legislative director's name. Um, I get continuously frustrated every time someone you know loops in my boss on that but it does help hold you accountable to a response you know so make sure that you're getting your case heard and you're include the legislative director of the la and the lc if you can great okay so next we just have um a quick template for you all to look at um i I just want to note that the subject line, um, it's clear in terms of like what you're what you're trying to achieve through this email, because oftentimes staffers get um, overwhelmed by lots of emails. So it's really good to um, state clearly in the subject line um, that it is a meeting that you're requesting, especially to mention that it is within the city or state to kind of indicate that um, this is constituent advocacy. So, um, yeah, we just have this quick little template right here. Um, which just says it's introducing yourself, saying um, where you're from, um, which organization you, you work for, which school district you may represent or may be working at, and what exactly you want, which is you want to meet about this specific topic and um, just making your ask clear and as concise as possible. Just to add on that, um, uh, essentially, what you said, Eileen, about you know making sure that they know that you're from the state um, that you're contacting. In my office, for instance, you know we try to meet with everyone outside, you know, from Alaska and outside of Alaska. But if you are Alaskan, we have we have to meet with you. The senator's first priority is to meet with every Alaskan and talk to every Alaskan. You know, if she can't talk to them, then she wants to find someone in her office to talk to them as soon as possible. Um, so I can't stress enough to really make sure I would put in the subject line, um, you know, Alaskans would like to contact Senator Murkowski or, you know, West Virginians would like to talk to someone about this issue um, just so that the staff know this is a constituent meeting request. Thank you, Anna. Um, so once again, um, as we've mentioned, with the pandemic, most offices, they have made the switch to mostly um, virtual meetings or socially distanced meetings um, for everyone's safety, of course. And so once you do the initial reach out and send the email, staff will typically reply um, with a time or date that they're available, or um, they might loop in another staffer who is able to meet with you. Um, going off of, definitely going off of what TJ was mentioning earlier. And, and then of course, um, no matter who you meet with, it's still just as important and it's definitely going to help you um, to advance 
whatever it is, whatever issue you're trying to bring across. And then one other thing, um, SHC, we've actually been working um, for the past few weeks and we have been setting up virtual congressional meetings between um, constituents like um, liaison and service providers and um, the education staffers for um, for their respective members of Congress and senators and um, they've been going really well and we just want to let everyone know that um, this is something that's definitely available to you um, if for some reason this may seem a bit overwhelming um, please don't be afraid to reach out to SHC we are absolutely more than happy to set up these meetings for you you can um, send me an email or we have this um, sign up form as well I will also send that in the chat if you're interested and um, we'd be more than happy to help um, further facilitate your advocacy So just, so just some, oh, whoops, so sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, you keep going. Okay, so um, just a few tips. Um, just want to um, emphasize the fact that relationships with staff, um, building, like creating and building these relationships are super essential um, because of course, um, it's not every time that you're going to get to necessarily meet with the member themselves, but staffers are so critical to the, um, to the work of, senators and, and US representatives. Um, so having a good relationship with the staffers is super important um, for, it, it's so, first of all, it's great for them to just know um, who is in the district, what's going on in the district, what the, what the people in the district want, but then it's also even more important to know that they have you as a resource in case um, there is some legislation that comes up that's in an area pertaining to um, your areas of interest and they know that this is someone that they can refer to. Um, and Barbara, I'll let you take over the rest. Thanks. Okay. Okay. One point I want just to Please. Yeah, the only thing that uh, I'd like to highlight here is that oftentimes you're going to be connected with somebody um, that isn't necessarily the legislative team if you're trying to schedule a meeting with the senator and or if and when hopefully soon that we get the opportunity to meet face to face, you're probably going to encounter uh, two to three, maybe even five staffers uh, that are not the legislative team. I would encourage you to make genuine connections with them as best as possible. Genuinely, the people that you'll be interacting with are staff assistants and or scheduling members. And those staff assistants and scheduling team today could potentially be your legislative staffer the next time that you come into town or the next opportunity that you have to connect with them. The Hill is notorious for being a high turnover um, area. I've been with my boss for six years and which seems like a lifetime on the Hill, but uh, you know, just, I would just encourage you to make as many genuine connections with as many different uh, members of the team as possible. And to, to TJ's point, what I was going to emphasize is that turnover and the sort of the second bullet there about the commitment of the member of Congress once they are really like the issue is a high priority, then even if staff turn, turns over, it still kind of gets passed on to the new staff as like this is a top priority. So an example I like to give is actually a member of Congress who's no longer a member of Congress, but Congresswoman Judy Biggert from Illinois was uh, in Congress for a long time. And um, it, you know, there was, I, I worked with her office closely and it, it didn't matter. I would always get so, and I do get anxious when staff leave, but it's another story. Um, but when her staff um, would leave, um, I knew that it was gonna be handed to the next person. And so she had excellent staff um, and it was, they were always told that this is one of her top priorities. So um, the staff piece is obviously the most important but you know, working to other ways to get members to commit to an issue, it, it also can be very important too, because then they'll signal um, to the staff. And I don't know, TJ and Anna, if you want to jump in there too about kind of your, your how your bosses kind of handle their commitment to specific issues. Yeah, I think um, I think that's really helpful. I I want to touch a little bit on what TJ said. I think the point on you know, ensuring that you include the scheduler um, on emails and reaching out, especially if you want to have a meeting with uh, the senator. My advice actually would be when you um, include the legislative staff to always include the scheduler and then to ask always for a meeting with the senator first. Um, usually I think that's the best thing to always say, is the senator available? Um, and you know, if they aren't, they will tell you right away way no and they will most likely offer you a meeting with their legislative team and if they don't feel free to say um, no worries I, I, you know I'm more than happy to meet with a policy team um, but in our office for instance our scheduler um, is probably the closest person to our boss because she's with our boss 24 7 she's been in our office for 20 years um, and they're very very close and so you know our scheduler um, 
constituents who've met, who've known the scheduler for years, the scheduler can kind of find out, oh, you know, these issues are really important to the senator and the scheduler is actually the one who will make sure that, you know, you get that time with the boss or that time with legislative staff. So you really don't, it's hard because each office is so different and the structures are different, but what TJ's point, it's, it's so true. You really don't know kind of the dynamics. And so just, I would encourage you to all make good relationships with everyone, including all the administrative staff as well. I think that's a really good, important point. Great. Um, so we're going to move now into sort of the, the preparing and then the during and the after. So, uh, you know, obviously you're you're writing or you're wanting to meet or communicate with Congress for a particular reason. So it's important to be familiar generally with the top issues that Congress is considering that relate. Um, and, you know, on our website, we've got a, a federal policy page, um, as do our partners, for example, the National Network for Youth is a great partner and their federal policy page, just to sort of get a sense of the range of issues that Congress is current currently considering. So you know the context when you're coming in with your specific request to talk about children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. And it can be helpful, particularly if you've had no contact with the, with the member or with their office, to do a little bit of research to see, have they expressed an interest in something that can be connected? We know that homelessness affects every aspect of a child, youth, and family's life, every aspect. Um, so for example, the member may have um, gone on record about trafficking, direct connection to homelessness, about opioid, direct connection to homelessness, um, child abuse and neglect, mental health, housing issues, all of these interconnected issues. So even if you know they they haven't been known to be outspoken or or to have um, taken a stand, for example, on anything related to homelessness, any of these related issues can be helpful to know about because you can connect it to what what you do and show that there's a connection between the work of addressing child, youth, and family homelessness, and whatever some of their top priorities are. Um, and I'll again, I'll stop here and see if TJ or Anna have anything to add to this particular strategy. Yeah, and I think the easiest way to do this is by going to that member's website. Every member has a website and they have a specific section that is either called news or press or happening now or some variation thereof. And you can type in those keywords to see what the member has said within you can get it down to an issue topic. You can pick uh, if you want to see what they've done in the month of December in X year. Uh, you get there's different filters that you can choose. Um, but if you're just trying to get a general sense of where a member stands on a particular issue, that is the key way I am able to connect and find what other members are. Um, you know, whenever I'm trying to reach out to another office to talk about a homelessness issue, those are the exact keywords I go to a member's page and type on to see what they have co-sponsored what they are writing about in the press, what have they done as an opt-ed or local news hit. Um, because when a member is putting it on their website and really emphasizing that issue to a level with their name beside of it, it generally has you know, a, a large significant impact um, on their work. And so that's the easiest way that I would recommend to do that. But at the end of the day, even if you're not able to find something that they have done or a, a, something that they went on the record doing, you should try your best to make it the home case for it um, and how they could take this issue and make it their own and or how it would impact their district or state. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Aliane. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, wait, Anna, did you want to chime in? Oh. Oh, I just wanted to say um, that I agreed and I, I can't stress enough how vital the meetings are with the constituents. You know, I'm actually going to take more out of a meeting with an Alaskan and hearing what's happening on the ground. I think as much as you can kind of argue for a, a specific issue, but you can also tell them, listen, I want to report to you what's happening on the ground in real time and give you a real update of what's happening in your state. That's okay too, you know, um, to kind of tie it in because um, I'm going to take that information and use it in my memos to the senator and kind of my arguments to them. So I, all the information you provide is really vital. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so here is just another graphic from the Congressional Management Foundation um, that we wanted to point out. This is based on a survey of um, both Democrat and Republican staffers. And the question that was asked to them is, in thinking about constituents and the groups that represent them, for example, associations, nonprofits, and companies, what should they do more or less of to build better relationships with your office and your member or senator? And um, 
the overwhelming majority of persons mentioned that um, they should that person should provide more materials and whether this is this comes in the form of um, infographics or um, charts one other thing that um, you can do that we have found um, has been effective in the past is providing um, pie charts and you can in these pie charts you can provide information um, specific to your um, your district maybe your school district that um, for example shows how homelessness exists in that district so you can show the number of students who are doubled up the number of students who are in motels, the number of students who are sheltered, the students who are unsheltered, just so they can get a better idea of um, what's actually going on there, what it looks like, um, what the issue is. Um, next slide, please. Or do, do TJ and Anna, do you guys have anything to add to that in terms of like um, how helpful materials may be for you whenever you're in meetings? I think you covered it um, just as pretty as possible and uh, as easy to read um, as, as simple as you can get it is, is always the best policy. Thank you. So going off of that, um, one other thing to do is you can prepare a one pager. So um, this document, it can be one or two sided and um, just basically containing local or state information that um, directly relates to the issues that you're trying to get the member or senator to support or take action on. Um, so you can include information. You can, um, once again, you can, intrude, you can include your graph um, on this. You can let them know things such as um, whether or not your school district received EHCY subgrants. If you do receive a subgrant, um, how the um, money is used to support these students or something like that. But if you're finding trouble um, to prepare this, SH, once again, SHC is um, totally willing to help and we will absolutely um, help you to create um, a, a one pager specific to your state. Um, and definitely including local statistics and data is helpful. And um, during the meeting itself, be prepared to provide anecdotes or specific examples or stories that um, directly relate to the um, legislation or the policy issue that um, you want them to support. Um, so, for example, um, if it is if you are looking for support on legislation that provides flexible funding to children and youth um, experience homelessness, maybe you can provide an example um, where uh, maybe. Um, a system that's currently in place um, does not meet these needs or um, you had a family who needed help in this specific way but you weren't um, allowed to based on um, the nature of the funds that you have if you have even received funds um, so that will be that will definitely be helpful and um, also if you don't have the time to prepare the document or to even reach out to SHC, SHC um, prior to your meeting um, just jotting down some talking points that you have um, for yourself like some key points that you know that you want to hit or make during your meeting and then send over the information to the staff after the meeting in follow-up um but we'll cover a little more in follow-up further down the line um but now i believe i'm passing to barbara okay so we've covered sort of the basics about you know who to reach out to how to reach out how to prepare so the actual time that you're in the visit with the member or with the staff. I mean, this is very basic, so I won't go over all the six points here. Um, in, in many ways, you know, if you're doing this work, you know what an effective meeting looks like, you know how you generally start. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of difference between this sort of a meeting and other meetings, other than, of course, wanting to make it be very focused around the specific issues. Um, so again, this is sort of the general anatomy of a meeting, introductions, the purpose, asking if the staff or if the member is familiar with um, I don't think we can assume necessarily that people, um, whether they're members or whether they're staff, that they know what McKinney Vento is, that they know what the definition of homelessness is, that they know what the restrictions on how you can use HUD homeless assistance. So, you know, it, it can be important to do um, a little bit of ground setting, um, ask if they're familiar. If they are, you can go faster. If they say that they, uh, or if they say that they're not, then, you know, you need to take a little bit more time so that you're not sort of talking in acronyms or talking about something with a general assumption of, of knowledge. Of course, we've talked about kind of sharing the, the specific local information, the personal information and the stories. And then of course, in closing, you know, you're there for a reason. So you have a specific ask, something that you'd like um, the member to know or to do specifically, and of course the thank you. So generally speaking, that's kind of the general contours, but I really want to hear from TJ and Anna about this and to give us some examples of 
meetings that have gone particularly well, um, things that aren't on here, or maybe uh, things to avoid. Sometimes it's helpful to think about do's and don'ts. And again, our whole purpose in this training is to really increase your um, excitement and knowledge so you feel equipped to make these meetings with or without our help. But I think sometimes it helps to say, here's a specific example of a meeting that went well, Here's one that maybe don't do something. So I'd like to turn it over to TJ and Anna to sort of give us some examples of what this looks like. Um, I can start if, if you're okay with that, TJ. Um, I think kind of going through all of this, I'm gonna be real honest with you all. Um, we as staff have a lot of these meetings, you know, with a lot of different groups. And I think for me, what really works is so a lot of this information first of all all the information that you're getting is vital and the staff need all of this information but i think what's amazing is that if you allow kind of barbara and eileen and school health connection to help you prep beforehand you can provide a lot of this uh, information through email with the staffers and spend the actual meeting which is only going to be kind of 30 minutes you know maybe 45 if you're lucky to really just try to connect with them on a human level um, and I remember the meetings where I actually, you know, am able to kind of develop a connection with with that kind of group. And honestly, you know, the issues that you work on are, we all know, are a very emotional kind of, you know, heart wrenching issues, um, but also have ups and downs and amazing issues. And I think, you know, using that time to really just connect and kind of tell stories of your experience and what it's like that you know that what you have to do on a daily basis, that is going to be what really makes the member. Uh, remember the meeting and the staff remember the meeting and for me you know I had a really good meeting that uh, eventually led to me um, going to go visit um, a McKinney Vento liaison in Alaska and then I decided to go visit you know the homeless youth shelter in Alaska and I think you know at the last point says to um, invite for a uh, socially distant distance site visit you know COVID will end eventually at least that's what I keep telling myself um, but I think everyone should always you know really extend open invitation to the member but also to the staff you know I think a lot of times we'll want to invite the member of Congress but invite that staff member you know say hey you know when did you get to travel up to the state do you get to come back for constituent meetings and and kind of offer something you know maybe off the the cusp you know you know a tour of the school or a tour of the community and kind of sh you know show them different sites that you have interactions with or um you know if you if they want to talk to, talk to uh, trafficking liaisons or something like that so i think thinking of creative ways to kind of form that human connection with people especially in this virtual time is going to be what really makes or break as long as i have those legislative asks before going into a meeting you know through email i could spend the entire meeting just talking about those that person's experiences and be really happy and kind of be more willing to ask than if i'm talking to someone who just has talking points um that have been given to them by another organization and that are really kind of not that they're not comfortable with and, and kind of listening to that so i hope that all makes sense yeah and just to add on to that i think you know uh anna hit the nail on the head there please send over the information that your legislative asks prior to preferably the day before because i spend my evenings kind of going through the meetings that I have for the next day and kind of looking through some of those policies just so that, you know, I know that what I'm talking about and prepared to represent it, represent the senator, you know, effectively. And so um, the other thing that I'll mention is always send a follow up email, even if the conversation was really great and, you know, you all shared and you connected and also include the same if or make sure that your asks are also included in that follow up email, even if you send it the day before. Um, I just, I'd rather have two emails with the same amount of information than not have an email with any information in it. And, um, you know, I think for me, the best meetings, honestly, are when we're able just to have an honest conversation come in. Um, don't be intimidated. We are not here to, you know, be mean and vicious. Uh, it's not like you see on TV. We're actually, uh, you know, here because we believe that we're able to do something good. And I fundamentally believe that for uh, the vast majority of, you know, Hill staffers and, and congressmen and women as well uh, in, in, on both sides of the aisle. Um, everyone has a different interpretation of what good means. And I think it's our job um, as both advocates and constituents, because I also fall into that category, even though I am a congressional staffer, to make sure that our members of Congress are, you know, up to date on what issues we care about and why they should care about it. 
it is great that you are passionate about an issue. Um, and I would never, ever, you know, diminish your level of enthusiasm for an issue. Um, the onerous is kind of on you, though, to make sure that your member of Congress and their team uh, have an understanding of why it's important to you, but also why should they, you know, be involved? Does it have an impact on the constituents that they serve or their district or their state? And, um, you know, it's it's always hard to, to set through a meeting when people are coming in uh, and they're just kind of reading talking points and have really no understanding or concept of what it is. If you don't know something, that is okay. Uh, do not pretend and do not make something up. Uh, the worst thing that you can do is provide me false information um, because at the end of the day, not only am I not going to trust you, I'm less likely to want to engage with you. Um, if you are West Virginian, we will always take that meeting, um, but we will have to have you know, some open and frank dialogue uh, the next time that we do meet. And I think Senator Manchin has always been a straight shooter and that's kind of how we operate in our office. And that's how most offices I would, I would you know, gamble to just say actually operate as well. So you know, um, it's, it's a little nerve wracking your first time, but um, if you can you know, make a connection with them. I always, I'm a West Virginian, so I love meeting uh, folks from the state, and um, I visited all 55 counties throughout my my time with the senator, so I'm able to have that connection uh, and and talk about the restaurants in in Wheeling, West Virginia, that are my favorite, or the local fire department that is like super unique, or the covered bridge here, or that whatever the case may be. And so, if you're able to make those types of connections, um, please feel free to do so. But also know that you are likely the the higher level um, folks get in the office, the less likely they are to be from the state. Um, because you're really looking for policy experts to guide a senator or a member's agenda. So if they're not from the state and they don't necessarily talk like you or sound like you or look like you, uh, don't underestimate them. Give them the benefit of the doubt and, you know, kind of show them that Southern hospitality that we like to say in West Virginia, uh, or regardless of where you're from, North or South, um, you know, just give them a chance and just try to connect with them on any level that you possibly can. And, um, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. So just Send the information at the beginning and send that follow-up email with the information as well. Uh, be genuine, uh, be honest, be open. And you know, if you uh, need additional resources, it is okay to say, I can get back to you within 24 hours or by the end of the week, or I can connect you with so-and-so. Uh, that, that would be a better expert on this issue. So that's really all I have to add on this part. That's great. And you know, as, as um, Anna and TJ, as you were speaking about this, I was in my own mind, recalling about when I have gone to the Hill with liaisons or state coordinators or homeless service providers and just the difference it is with them there than like representing a national organization and the best meetings really be the ones the ones that had emotional connection where there were specific examples and even a virtual meeting that Al Aliana and I had a couple of weeks ago we were talking about COVID and about uh, the challenges accessing resources for families who are doubled up and um, you know one of the uh, people on the on the call gave an example about um, families who were kicked out because of of covid they, they had covid and they were kicked out and they didn't they literally had nowhere to go and sort of the challenges around that so um, that again staffers are people and members are people so um, telling those stories and that kind of connection i think definitely overrules all of our our six points of the anatomy of the of the hill visit uh, which are just kind of good structures to keep in mind generally um, I think we've covered a bunch of this, Ali, and I think this is you. Yeah, um, so all of these points right here, these tips that we have, um, they basically just underscore everything that um, TJ just said, and Anna as well, especially in terms of um, making it a conversation rather than a presentation, because of course staffers are people, and um, it makes it so much more, I feel like in, in that way, um, the information is also more digestible, um, like definitely feel free to ask them questions, um, ask if they understand or if they have questions, um, and then like TJ said, if you don't know the answer, um, just you, it's it's um, totally okay for you to say, you know what, I'll check on that for you and I'll send you an email and you can just include that in your follow-up as well. Um, and then um, also if you are going to be participating in group meetings to um, typically assign um, each person to conduct a, a different part of the, um, of the meeting. If there is um, at least one person in the group, like say not everyone um, does have that hometown connection, um, like say not everyone is a West Virginian, 
you can have that one West Virginian person um, open the meeting and um, introduce the group. Um, you can have another person who is going to be sort of moderating and leading you through the, through the um, meeting, another person who provides this type of information, and another person to close the meeting as well. And then, of course, once again, um, as um, both of our guests were saying, um, follow-up is super important. Um, like immediately after the, re the meeting, you could send the staff a thank you note for um, meeting with you. Um, if you did manage to prepare a one pager or um, some graphics with, inf with local or state information, you can include this in your email as well. Um, you, and just overall, definitely make sure to um, include your request again. Um, and just basically hitting or summarizing the topics that you covered during the meeting, just so that they have that to refer to um, at any point in time in the future, or if the issue um, is to arise again. And then, um, as Anna was saying as well, um, it's definitely important to try to organize a socially distanced, like if it is, if you are able to, and it is feasible, trying to organize a socially distanced meeting um, in the district um, when the member returns. That's also oftentimes like a really great way for constituents to just generally build relationships with the staffers and the members outside of the hustle and bustle of Capitol Hill. So that's definitely something for persons to um, look forward to and look into as you continue with your advocacy. And then also looking for reasons to stay in touch. Um, and this can be something, um, and this is more like the long term. So this can be something as simple as sending local news articles. Like say you um, find a news article about um, a homeless family in your district or um, or some new funding stream or just anything that's relevant to the um, specific issue area that um, you are advocating for, feel free to send that over to the staff and just be like, hey, I thought this would be good for you to know or this is really relevant to the district right now. So I just felt it would be good for you to have this. And um, trust me, they would appreciate it. I'm sure TJ and Anna can um, chime in on that as well. Or um, reaching out just if you find out that um, say after your meeting and you um, were hoping that the member would um, sign on as a co-sponsor to show support for a specific piece of legislation if you found that they maybe have signed on as a co-sponsor even just reaching out to say a simple thank you to the senator or to the representative for signing on um, that's just a, another great way to um, continue to build and foster the relationship I think I would just add um, one thing in here is that Barbara, um, you know, is a policy expert. She's phenomenal. Um, and I, I think it's important that you might get a lot of questions, um, you know, before or after about legislation or kind of like TJ was saying, you might not know. And I think um, something that can really make an impact is to write down those questions and then to email Barbara those questions. And Barbara can either connect with the staffer um, specifically and kind of talk through them, um, or she can give you the answers and help you respond to them. The other thing is um, just connecting them with Barbara in general, I think is super helpful because, uh, you know, I think that you, the meeting that you're going to have with them, I personally think is, is a much better time to like Barbara and we've all been saying have that emotional connection, really develop a relationship. But in terms of kind of building on something from a policy perspective, I think it's important to be able to say, you know, we have resources. Um, you know, here is Barbara who is really well connected and can talk through some of the legislative priorities. Um, so those connections are also vital to ensure that they have kind of that political connection to, to answer those types of questions. We used to say like, have, have your people in Washington contact my people in Washington. <laughs> But awesome. No, um, absolutely. Um, definitely what Anna said. Um, that was another point that we actually had as well that we wanted to share with you all. Like, feel free to reach out to SHC if you um, had a meeting on your own or um, with a group. Um, definitely um, let us know how it went. Like, we want to know and we want to be updated with um, how your um, your advocacy endeavors are going. And we're, um, of course, always willing to um, be resources for you and for these staffers. Um, so definitely, if you do have any questions like that or in, in a situation like that, um, feel free to reach out to reach out to us and we will um, be more than happy to help you in whatever way that we can. Um, another thing is also if you if you are 
if you have a relationship with someone who has a relationship with the member or senator um, or you know a group that does, um, also feel free to reach out to them and let them follow up with the um, with the staffer or the member themselves as well, and that they can also elevate the issues um, of concern. Great. So we sort of that's sort of the the nuts and bolts of the actual meetings. There you you will frequently, I'm sure, if you're signed up to organizations or advocacy organizations, you'll get a call to action uh, where there'll be a link on a website, and it'll say, and we have this too, which we'll talk about, where you enter your zip code, and there's a template of a letter, and then the letter gets sent to the member of Congress. So they are not a substitute for face-to-face -face meetings. There is no substitute, or even for phone calls. There's no substitute for the relationship building the storytelling and the connection that happens in meetings, but there is sometimes a place for generating large numbers of personally edited electronic level, uh, letters. So um, they're, they're, they don't, they're not a substitute, but they can be a helpful supplement to advocacy. Um, so for example, if you're doing that, like for example, you get something from Schoolhouse Connection, like perhaps in a slide or two from now, and it says, you know, send a message, it's important to make sure those are edited. So the form letters are, are not nearly as helpful. And I'm sure I, I actually would love to hear what TJ and Anna have to say about how their offices handle form letters versus letters that are personalized. In fact, I'll stop here and turn it over to them to see how they want to comment about that. Sure, I'm happy to kick it off here. The form, form letters are great for counting a large hot topic, if that makes sense. Um, the hot button issues of the day, whether it be you know impeachment or um, a Supreme Court justice or immigration in general, um, form letters are not necessarily the best for like deep policy issues. Um, unless it's just a very, unless it's a super hot topic issue, you know, um, the way that we do form letters is if they're from a West Virginia, a West Virginian, and they have a West Virginia zip code, we will respond to them. Uh, absolutely, we count their vote, uh, what, how they would like us to vote and or, uh, you know, co-sponsor or stay off of or whatever the case may be. Um, at the end of the day, though, um, you know, it is hard to sit down on the phone with 6,000 West Virginians that wrote in asking us to support or oppose X nominee for X cabinet position. And so whenever it's large topics like that, please organize as many uh, residents. Now for our office to like actually know that you're West Virginia, we need your address. We need that zip code. Uh, so that way we can put you uh, not necessarily in the system, but so that way we can communicate the Senator's response back to you. Um, oftentimes people will call us from New York and California and Florida and everywhere in between. And while we understand that our vote does impact those, you know, across the country at a federal level, uh, we were sent here by West Virginians to represent West Virginia's voice. And so we really want to hear from our home state members. And I think that goes uh, for each member of Congress as well. Uh, you want to have as many people from that district or that, that state. So uh, yes, sign on to those form letters. Yes, please send us your thoughts and opinions on literally anything and everything. But at the end of the day, if there's an issue that you really care about and you really want us to make you know, substantive policy changes on, pick up the phone, send us an email, um, ask for a meeting. Um, we really want to come to our constituent events that we have back in the state. We want to meet you. We want to see you. And if you're connecting with our state team, oftentimes they're a direct line to the senator as well. Um, so make sure that you're doing all different forms of, uh, as mentioned in this previously, um, please send the form letters, but don't let that be the end all be all on issues that you really care about. Yeah, I think I would just agree with everything. Can you hear me? Yep. Is, is this okay. Um, everything that TJ just said, I think nothing substitutes um, for a phone call or a meeting. I, I just, honestly, I don't think we've talked a lot about this today, but um, our legislative correspondents are usually going to be the, the key staffers um, that are responsible for, for dealing with kind of written correspondence. Um, and so usually um, staff, we work on a response, but you know, the person the, the staffer who's going to be uh, you know, kind of shuffling things to and from the senator is going to be that legislative correspondent. And so being able to just talk to everyone in, in the room at the same time can ensure that not everyone is um, missing something, right? That that every staff really hears that message. And I just think, you know, COVID-19, you know, every the, the struggle with the, the kind of loneliness, you know, disconnection, that's true across the board, even for Congress. And so 
you know, anytime that we can have interaction with anyone, to be honest, I think is a huge plus. Um, and we need more of it, not less of it. And so I would really encourage you when you can to pick up the phone. Um, my cell phone line is in my signature. And I always tell constituents, you know, call me whenever you need, you know, don't feel the need to even, you know, for my Alaskans, I tell them just you don't, you don't even need necessarily a scheduled a meeting and not every staffer is going to have that close relationship with with their constituents but some will but you know constituents never actually call me right there's kind of a weird you know disconnect i think they might feel uncomfortable but you know when i say the door is open i truly mean that and if they do call me you know the, the couple that do i always call them back and i'm always really excited to hear from them so you know if they offer something and offer for you to kind of you know, connect via a cell phone or anything like that, take them up on it and call them, you know, occasionally and just check in on them and, and give them an update of what, what what's happening at home. Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna talk about what you can do right now to sort of uh, take all of these pieces. Um, there is, as I'm sure everyone has heard, a COVID package moving through Congress. Um, our concern um, and the concern of our partners at the National Network for Youth and other organizations is that um, that doesn't actually there's there's um, not targeted funding for children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness, and if it isn't targeted, it's not it's not likely to reach them. So we're at a point now with this particular issue, and of course I want to hear um, what TJ and Anna have to say. Where the email and information, the emails can be very important because there may not things are moving quickly. There may not be time for a meeting with the member necessarily. Um, and I see we have an extra S in homelessness, so uh, we need to fix that slide. Um, but in any case, um, this is the kind of message that uh, we really need to be sent right now. We need targeted but flexible funding for children and youth experiencing homelessness in this next package. If there is not targeted funding, they're not likely to benefit from other education or housing investments because they have significant barriers to safety, education, child care. And here's you know, a link to a study that shows what happens if you don't actually target it. Now, obviously, this is one piece that our organizations have been very focused on and that Senator Manchin and Senator Murkowski have also been very focused on. Um, so I want to, you know, let's see, next step. So that, so that would be like the sample message. Obviously, you would want to edit it, personalize it, make sure you send it to the right person. Um, and there's a list there if you already know somebody. But I want to stop here, go back to this and just let TJ and Anna talk for a little bit about kind of the now, like what's happening now and the importance of this kind of a message and this kind of outreach, what to do right in this moment. Yeah, um, right now it's a critical moment and we need you all to mobilize and engage. Um, as someone, uh, Ann and I have been partnering now for, you know, the better part of, of a year, uh, if not more, um, to, to really define the unique uh, ways to address children, youth and families experiencing homelessness. And, you know, we have been uh, thrilled to receive so much support from, you know, advocates all across the country and even here uh, in terms of members of Congress. But right now, the House of Representatives is working on a reconciliate reconciliation package um, that will be moving forward either sometime this week or this weekend, we expect it to come over to the Senate. Um, and so what we need from you is to hear what, what you need most in your communities. And we, particularly my New York and Washington state friends that are on this right now, uh, contact your senators. Uh, they need to hear from you. Um, and the reason I mentioned those two is because Chuck Schumer is majority leader, but we also have Kirsten Gillibrand from New York. And in Washington state, we have Patty Murray um, and we have uh, Maria Cantwell as uh, also serving in that state. Let's. And Patty Murray is the chair, chairman of uh, the Senate Health, Education and Labor uh, Pensions Committee that oversees a lot of this funding in the more broad definition uh, of homelessness. So if you can engage, let us know that, you know, how families have been impacted. Um, but obviously every member, every person on this should be reaching out to their member of Congress as well to let them know how your districts and how your states are have been impacted by homelessness. Um, we do know that with many schools still not fully reopened, we don't have an accurate uh, count of how many students have been impacted and those that were already experiencing homelessness prior to the pandemic, you know, kind of where are they now? Um, the, the, the learning loss is, is very important, but also just the social and emotional health of students is something that we're really missing right now. So um, I highly encourage you all to, to, to weigh in. Um, 
obviously there's legislation out there that we would love to see included uh there is some you know potential setbacks with that because of how the rules are written on what types of uh what type of legislation or budgetary impact can move forward and i know that gets a little bit wonky but at the end of the day if you can just communicate the words dedicated funding for children families and youth experiencing homelessness under the broader definition, that is what we need to get to every single member of Congress and don't let up, hold them accountable. Um, so that's that's my advice right now. And just a couple things. I think um, it's important that a lot, the, the, I think the biggest question you're gonna get and Barbara and Eileen, you can help uh, with this as well and you should let them know what you think too, but they're gonna ask you, well, as the package stands now, is there dedicated funding? And the answer is no, there is not. And then that has to be the biggest thing that comes across. And you know, if they say, oh, well, you know, how are we gonna do that? You can say, well, we have a proposal out there to do that. Um, and we are happy to work with you. We know that there is a lot of interest um, and you know, support in the Senate to, to get dedicated, to see dedicated funding um, in this next package. So I think that's the most important thing to communicate. I think the other thing I just wanna say, um is you know politics is kind of a mess right now um not gonna lie and so i think that i just want to kind of reiterate i think even when i talk to my family i don't think people really realize you know how much of a difference it makes for members of congress to hear from their constituents um i think because politics is such a mess that sometimes it can just i mean i even get i feel frustrated sometimes and just it can be frustrating you can feel like your voice isn't being heard if you don't see kind of results from your advocacy the next day um but i just want to let you know that tj and i are kind of living proof to tell you that our every single day in our job um is really based on what constituents say and what constituents need and what they want and what they talk to the senators about um you know each senator is different how they actually achieve their goals and what they hear but each one is going to want to hear from their constituents so just you know i know it can be frustrating i always tell people <laughs> i always tell people i hate politics i'm not in politics i'm in policy policy is different than politics at the end of the day you know i think we're going to be surprised about how many people uh, on capitol hill across the aisle have similar policy goals when it comes to this issue of, of youth children and family homelessness you know it's just a matter of let's get over the politics let's put the politics aside and concentrate on getting the policy done um, and we need all of you on this on this call and on this webinar to help us uh to get this done we really your your kind of re reach out is essential thank you very much so we are now um kind of getting close to the end of time so i'm going to skip through our little rally congress you all know how to read so you can download the powerpoint and figure all this out and i want to stop now uh, and commercial advertisement for next week you can learn from your peers who've done this very well and alian will be facilitating a, a kind of a conversation like a talk show uh, webinar version but i want to stop now while we are so lucky to have anna and tj with us to see if you have questions for them so We'll take the last minutes of the webinar here. We're already a little bit over time, but really want to make sure that if there's any questions you have, please enter them into the questions pane here. Um, and while this is going to be, I could, I could make the, the sound from Jeopardy, but nobody wants to hear that. So while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, uh, TJ, and if there's anything else that you, you want to say before we um, turn to questions. Nope, uh, nothing final here. Thank you all for listening today. Um, last word of advice, give yourself some grace uh, and give the staffer that you're working with some grace as well. We're all here uh, trying to do the right thing and we just appreciate you all uh, being our eyes and ears on the ground. So however we can be helpful, that's our, that's our number one priority. So thank you all. Great, I'm not seeing questions come in. So I am going to actually, I will go backwards and, um, Alian, do you want to close up, finish us up? Okay, no problem. Um, so thank you, the, a, a huge thank you to everyone who joined us today. And of course, a huge thank you to our special guest this week, um, 
TJ and Anna, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I hope that everyone um, took something um, useful away from this session and I hope that um, it fires you up a little bit more to participate in advocacy and just to feel a little bit more com comfortable and confident in your own ability to do it because um, you definitely can do it. As TJ said, give yourself some grace, give the staffer some grace and um, there are definitely people there who want the same thing that we want, the same thing that we're advocating for. So. Um, um, just march on and um, we will hopefully influence some change really soon. Thanks, and everybody. Also, <laughs> sorry. Yes, thank you again. And then we hope to see everyone next week to join us for our conversation with peers. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much to Anna and TJ, and we'll see everyone next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.